Welcome to the Vanda About podcast series. Today I've come to the Murray Delta Duke Joint to check out the place that everybody's talking about lately. Let's go inside and have a look around. Oh, g'day, Dolly, mate. Yes. How are you going? Good to see you, Dolly. Good on you. Great for you to come down. Well, I had to come and check out the place that everybody's talking about. Uh, good on you. There's a few talking about it, isn't there? Yeah, there certainly is. I'm going to chuck these up there. Is that all right? Yeah, all right. I'll we'll follow you up. Go and have a look. look. We've done new stairs. We've re-sprung the whole thing so there's no vibrations in this stage at all. It's all uh, acoustically treated. There's not one piece of wood going under another piece of wood. We've insulated everything so there's no vibration. Good acoustic lining underneath it. Great carpet on it. Hey, Greg. Backing, air gaps, heavy duty rows. So acoustically, it's absolutely gorgeous. And the musos love it. Yeah. They absolutely love it. They, uh, you know, uh, yeah, no, they, they, they speak really highly of it. And that was our aim. We were going to make a, a theatre for musos. Yeah? It's, it's not a pub. You know, you probably heard me say this before. But it, it was all about the music, this thing, and Greg and I. We walked in here three years ago, eh, Greg? Yeah. When the Boogies were doing a gig and Greg and I were working together then, you know. We've done sound together since early days. And, and uh, we looked at each other and said, oh, you know, what's he done here? This is Chris and Anita. We're going to have a list of records. We looked at each other and said, one of us said, this joint never comes up with you. Know, right? And three years later, he rang me up. He said, guess what? Records are up. Have a go. So that was the day I got back from Cambodia from the Plan B thing to it. He rang me up. COVID hit the next day, full on. Everything shut down and we started work. What we're, what we're doing, we're just setting up really at the moment for our digital side because we're both love us, we're both analog guys, but with a digital recording background. Um, I mean, I've spent years in recording and performing, as you probably know. But, uh, the digital thing, it's okay if, you, if you're just doing it in the studio, but if you're going to do it live, you've got to be good and you can't mess it up, right? So just back, come back through here for a minute. So what we have here is, uh, so this is just our, uh, this is just our Alan Heath. I'll just bring up a bit. Streamlines. So this is our analog rig and all the gear underneath, um, EQs and the compressors and reverbs and things. But then what we're really looking at, I'll just move this over here. Go, we'll go around the other side. So this is a bit of a, it's a bit of a flagship. These things are incredible. I mean, anyone that knows their digital desks knows about them. We're just learning. Um, as I say, the analog works beautifully in this room. We get nothing but great comments about our, our audio. But what we're going to do is... Um, actually, Lazy Eye are coming up and they're doing a, the first 24-track digital recording, plus we're going to video. So what we're going to do is we're going to take everything out of the analog desk, run into the digital AD converters in this, and we'll hopefully come out with... Well, Evan will come out with a really nice album. Mm -hmm. First one in the studio here. So, as you're saying, really, it, it's a live performance area that's, that's doubling as a recording studio. So, the beauty of it is the characteristics of the stage are built for recording, but it also works beautifully for performance. So, people could come down here midweek, record an EP, choose three or four songs they want to do, do them studio wise, work them out, sell out a gig on a Friday night, recoup some of their dough on income. Not only do they get their EP in a studio environment, they get a live version of it with audience participation. So it's kind of a double, a, a, a dual, you know, double banger. It's not a double-edged sword. I think that invokes negative connotations, but <laughs> it's, um, we're really hoping that model works. And there's a few really good artists who are really keen to do it. And as I say, Lazy Eye, Evan is the first one to do it, Evan and Erica. It's a really tricky game. I've got to tell you, in the, in the booking game, it's, uh, I'm new to the booking. I, I've managed bands and the boogeyman and a few other things over the years. And it's 
it's bad enough, you know what it's like, it's bad enough looking after one band yeah. doing the things you've got to do, but when you're trying to coordinate a bunch of bands and a bunch of great folk and, you know, there's pushy ones and there's not pushy ones and there's people you've got to ask to play and there's people that are desperate to play, and you, there's this fine line between acceptance and rejection, and it's never rejection, it's just a matter of us trying to slot in what we think will work with audiences, because mm -hmm. we're here, two reasons, right, one for the bands, but secondly, we've got to, we've got to satisfy our audience and grow our market, and uh, it's working both ways, but there's a few bands that are getting itchy feet and like to play. Mm. I mean, people will play here, you know what it's like, you play on a great stage and it's just great fun to play, right? It, you're in the CD, you're not in this live room trying to hear the vocalist or, you know, all you can hear is the guitar player. We don't do that. We keep our stage volumes down and everyone complies with it, so we can always lift the production. We've got beautiful foldbacks, so there's always, there's always nice stage sound. We haven't had one so far where people have walked off beaming, you know, and we love that. <laughs> it's fabulous. Part of our, another tricky part about doing a, a venue is trying to appeal to more genre markets, mm. as you know, right? So, primarily we're out of the blues world, blues folk world. Um, so we draw on any of the bands that we've had, you know, since from hip tones and all, going right back. Mm. Oh, you know, I say right, 90s for me in terms of that world. Um, but so we can draw on that, but we didn't want to just be seen as a blues pub, and and there, so we've tried that we've brought in some a reggae band, local guys, reggae band, um, and the young dudes, younger dudes come in, not the real young ones. In terms, you know, my age talking about young, right? What's that mean? So we, you know, 18 year olds not interested. We can't cater for that audience in here unless we get whatever it is they do. <laughs> <laughs> Who knows these days? Flip side. We put in Smile Pepper. Oh, Everybody looks at these young guys. Oh, Smile in. Pepper are brilliant. Right? Right. Killer, right? <laughs> <laughs> Sam and his guys came in. Uh, great friend with their previous guitarist, yeah. who's now with the Z Boys, right? Yeah. Um, just, they came in, the audience looked, and wow, nailed it. Fantastic night, absolutely. I do an introduction, you know, I do the introduction at the start of these things, and, and um, Ask people to politely be quiet while the musicians are on stage. 99% of people love that. One or two percent don't like it at all. But generally speaking, people adore the fact. Uh, Carl said when he played here with the with the Saints, um, you know, well, this is not a gig. This this is this is a uh, what do you say? It's a concert. He said, "Are you out there?" You know, and, and I think Nick Capretis of the Stringline stopped the song. He said, "Did someone shush? Did I just hear someone shush someone in the audience?" You know, so we've got this thing about the theatre, and we adore that because you can play as softly as you well, like. Well, if you're going to room. be seated, you want to hear. What's your what's your My view? On okay, that so stuff? I have yeah. I'm, I come from a theatrical background. Yes. Originally, so oh. when I go to see a show, and especially if it's seated, I expect to be able to hear it. I don't expect to have people talking through it. No. No, it's a matter of paying respect. The musicians who are on stage and listening, and if I want to have a conversation, I can go outside and have that conversation. That's exactly rather right. than ruin other people's enjoyment. No, that's exactly it. So you, in one, and people pay, you know, twenty bucks, twenty five right. bucks, thirty bucks. I didn't pay that money to come and hear somebody. No, was talking. We've had a few times where Greg and I have both gone over and said to somebody, "Hey, please keep it down." You know, people mm. pay money. People mm. turn around. And you see, we. You know, I'm on the desk or beyond the bar, or Greg's on the desk behind the bar. We're pretty much a three-man show here. Greg, myself, share our, on everything we do, and my wife Ilda's, and actually Maggie Wynn, who's a local lady who's taken Ilda and I on board. We live on a farm when we're down here, a magnificent woman, and an uh, old hippie from the 70s touring around, you know, incredible stories of Canada and Europe and all that. But she helps us a lot with stuff. There's a few different people that have come in and, and help us out, and um, Carol, Carol Answorth, she's, she's amazing. People, our locals will come and clean, help us clean the room you know, after we finish gigs. 
you know, I distracted myself. That's fine. Keep going. So we were, so Ilda, my wife, she she's she sort of manages a lot of the stuff, with, you know, in terms of she does manages the door stuff, does the bar work with Greg or I. We all share, you know. Ilda's a bit of a spreadsheet genius, so she's helping Greg and I out with our book work and all that at the moment. So You've got to have somebody that can do that. Yeah. <laughs> I can do it, but we'd probably end up in prison. <laughs> so, so we shan't do that. No, not about prison, but we might end up somewhere where we don't want to be, you know, on the on the heap somewhere. But now this genre thing, right? So we've had uh, we've had the reggae band. They're called Little Fish, and they've, they've been playing down here for years and years. And they came into the joint and, and whooped it up, and people loved them. We sold it out. We had people jump on tables, though, you know, COVID drinks in the hand, so we shut that down and asked for people to just settle, please settle down, you know, I was a bit, actually, I was a bit like that, right? <laughs> but it kind of had to be, because you step on these tables, which which we've made, you step on the end of one of these tables, that will smack you in the face, yeah. and at the least break your nose, and if someone's next to you, it'll break their arm, and if a young a young lady did it, and somehow it went over on it, it would it would break things, you know, so... Mm. We shut that down real quick, not the gig, but we shut down. Yeah, it's not a good idea to be on the table. So, no. no, maybe <laughs> at some stage of our life it was right. Maybe in some sort of pubs it might be okay. <laughs> that's <laughs> right. I think that's it, isn't but it? But not the Murray Delta, right? No. no. <laughs> so, you know, as you say, it's kind of a, and I hate this word, but it's kind of a cabaret theatre. Oh, can I digress for a bit? It is a bit a, like that. It is a cabaret, mm. but it's not, oh, maybe it is, right? I'm in my 60s now, and I hate the word cabaret. <laughs> the Boogeymen, we play all the time. We play, we get good audience. Our average age is every, all these other bands that are playing, if you go to the Workers or any of these great clubs. Everyone's kind of 60, right? Mm. And when I was a kid, 60, and you're kind of in the nursing home, or, you know, we're going around on Sunday mornings to open some sausage rolls or something, right? These days, it's not like that at all. So the genre thing has, has been really amazing. Said, people say about all the oldies. We've been talking with some guys from a band called Storm Horse. Yes. And yeah, they're due here shortly. They'll be due here, so we'll have a, a young, younger, young crowd. Mm -hmm. Dusty Lee Stevens is coming. He's down the duties. He's got like those guys. Highly thought of um, musicians, mm -hmm. and yeah, they play blues. Mm -hmm. But it's youngsters showing you, like Jack Stevens. What you can do, mm -hmm. right? And uh, just can't wait to have them come on board and hopefully attract some of their following that's younger as well as older. Yeah. COVID. Okay, so as I already said earlier, um, we started this thing in March, pretty much the day the hammer fell on COVID. Greg and I started working on it, and everyone was shut down, right? Um, this place has got a license for about 115. We could, we could operate when we were allowed to first open. We had 32, you can't operate on 32 people. So, although we did do a couple of shows yeah. just for fun. But um, effectively, what COVID has done for us and for me, in, and for a lot of bands, Steve Brown, myself, Mike Hutton and the Boogie guys, we've written a, a, what we think is a really, really good album in that period because everyone's had so much downtime. We've also got to play some really cool shows. But Greg and I, as I've already said, we have a jazz gig, it might be 20 bucks. But pre-COVID, you would not pre-sell 90 tickets to a jazz gig at 20 bucks a head. Pre-COVID, you wouldn't sell out, you wouldn't sell out just about any gig in a pub. Maybe in a venue, right? A proper venue. But it's nowadays the culture has shifted with COVID. People value because there's there's a lack of international musicians, people have triggered onto the fact that local musicians, hey, they're pretty good, right? They're discovering a lot of the local bands now. They are. They have to discover, that's all that's been there for so long now, and they're enjoying it. They are, mm. that's the key, right? But they, they've discovered that local bands can do this stuff, and we've been doing it for years, and screaming out for audience, and suddenly we've got them. So, in all this mire that has been COVID, it's been, oh, I can't use, I'm gonna, it's a blessing for the music industry, geez, people will hate that, maybe. But no, there, there have been benefits. There have been benefits for Everybody it. has found a benefit. I mean, you, of course, there's been a lot of 
bad, negative, oh, yeah, some you know, really terrible. shut everything down overnight for quite a long time and nobody was prepared for that. But those that have been creative ha and those that have been making contact with their fans, yeah. spending more time concentrating on getting to know them yeah. and letting the fans, you know... Developing relationships. Developing relationships. But, yeah. They're the ones that are going to do really well come the other side. I think, I think too in there, sorry, Greg. The audience has been starved, right? Yeah. And all of a sudden, they've worked out that they value their live mm -hmm. entertainment. Mm -hmm. And uh, the people that, that play it have um, come up notches in their evaluation mm -hmm. all of a sudden. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's something that uh, we are hoping doesn't change. Mm -hmm. Because of the, the public all of a sudden just is going, wow, I really miss that. Mm. So hopefully uh, we can keep that level up there. And the musicians that are getting up there to perform are saying they really miss performing too. Yeah, so and, and now they've got an attentive audience. It's not just mm. the, the pokies in the corner of the Lovely. Party. Let's hope it stays that way. Right? Well, that's <laughs> right. See, the other thing, the other real beauty of COVID is that everyone's gone through their agents, you know, the different online asset ticket sales agencies and stuff. And everyone gets a database. We've built a database of nearly 700 people out of our gigs, and that wouldn't have happened without COVID. Mm -hmm. And out of, you know, I send a monthly newsletter, we send a monthly newsletter, um, with one click stops the bands, quick promo there. Um, so you don't have to go on Facebook or Instagram to, to work out what's going on. You can just open your email once a month, go, oh yeah, wow, crap, guys, man's playing. Click, you got a ticket. Bah. We had local guys come in and do a bunch of work for us, you know, put bench tops on, do all sorts of things. Um, so this is the work in progress out through here, Die. This will be a storage area and maybe a cold room at some stage. And this will be our studio at the moment. It's just our where everything gets stored that's kind of got value or stuff. But that this is sort of where all the business happens. But that will be our studio, you know, studio recording room. And then we go out into here, our collection of lights we're very proud of that we'll probably never use. <laughs> we got stuff all over. Um, and then, quick, you can get a photograph of my wife out here. Hilda. That's my wife, Hilda. Um, this is our workshop. And which we're going to turn into a dining area. That will be, that'll be a dining area out there if we're allowed to do it. And um, people can come out and get paella and pizza or whatever, you know. And then there's toilets and stuff here. But we've also got this other end, which is our um, escape to green room, really. Ah. So we can sort of, you know, cook. It's not permanent well, stuff. It's kind of green. It's kind of green room. <laughs> So this is great for us because it's got a fridge in it. Now, what would you like to drink, Di? I think you're probably going to have a drink, are you? Oh, is it lunchtime? <laughs> it's at least lunchtime. So Greg, name in this joint. You remember how we did that? Oh, you know, people used to say, coming to Gore, you needed to pack lunch. And uh, they'd say, where Gore? And I'd say, yeah, where the river meets the sea, you know. And uh, we were sitting around trying to work out a name and... And I said, well, the Coolongs of Delta, you've been over to, to Mississippi and New Orleans with Brownie, so Murray Delta. And uh, I wanted to call it a juke joint, right? So there you go, <laughs> the Murray Delta juke joint, you know. <laughs> People said, oh, Delta, you know. And I said, well, if you go back to the, the 1930s and get the first publications of Gula, you'll find on Wellesley's first book, it said, the New Orleans of Australia. Gula Wharf. It's true. You go back to early prints from the advertiser, the environs of Gula, the New Orleans of Australia. So basically, it all fell into place. Murray Delta Duke joint, and here we are. You know, there's a thing on the die where, so following on from what Greg was just saying then about, you go into, there's a few books we've taken photographs of, we haven't put on the walls yet, but it is. It is listed as the New Orleans of, of, um, of Australia. And uh, down when they were trading rum, I suppose it would have been back down in those days, 
you know, there were shady women and, and bands on the side of the river down here, apparently. There's no photos of that, but there was a, uh, it's got this, this kind of, you know, shady, dodgy <laughs> history back in the, back on the river mouth down here, so it's kind of ideal. And there's only one Murray Delta in Australia, and there's a Duke joint in it, so it works, you know, geographically it works, doesn't it? Early ship that went down the Mozambique, you know, the, the, the head off, off the front of the ships on the front of one of the hotels. And the piano off of it ended up here in Goa, probably on the wharf getting jangled whilst the tide was out, because there was no barrage. The boats had come in, the tide would go out, the boats would sit on the mud, and uh, party in a roadhouse. Party in a roadhouse? Party in a roadhouse. Sounds like a good band name. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Murray. So this is the beer garden. This will have food and people and music in it this summer. And uh, maybe not in that order, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever that means. Um, I just want to throw something out to Di for the work she does. Um, how many how many followers you got on your band at about now, Di? On the Facebook? Yeah, on your... On how many? Oh, um, 1,800, I think, yeah. So the chronology of bands that Di's gone out in her own time and filmed and recorded and helped promote and helped get careers. Oh, there's well over a thousand videos. Yeah. Well over a thousand videos. Mm -hmm. I mean, just a credit to you, Di. And uh, Greg and I really appreciate coming down here and doing this for us today as well, or with us, I reckon. And, and uh, good on your old power to you. Wish you every success. Lovely. Thank you for having me down, guys, and for showing me around. Absolute pleasure, Di. Thank you for making the effort, eh? Wonderful yeah. to see you. Look, I wish you all the, all the best. For the Thank future. you very much. I think this is a real goer. This is a place that you want to play. <laughs> we want you to play. Yeah. No, perfect. Thank you very much. We'll see you down here, too. Marvellous. And happy birthday. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> happy birthday. birthday. <laughs> All right, That's it from Band to the Bout, proudly supporting live music. <laughs>